is Richard Lamparski, and if you're an old radio fan, you know that by that theme, which is Drigo's Serenade, is that correct? That uh, today we're going to find out uh, what happens when a girl marries, because my guests are uh, Miss Mary Jane Higby and Mr. Louis Van Ruten. Um, was that the right theme? That's Drigo's the right Ser- theme, Serenade? exactly, yes. Did it put you in a mood? Yes. How long Very... since you've heard that? Oh, not too long. I think about eight years. Is it only we went off very years? late, yes. We were one of the last soap operas to go, and then after that I did Nora Drake at the CBS, and that uh, took in another 18 months, and I left the air, I think, in 59. You were the title role in Nora Drake? Yes, mm-hmm. Just the last Nora Drake. Previously, there had been several others. Mr. Van Druten? Well, uh, all I was going to say is it's a good theme, because it's Drigo's serenade from the millions of Harlequin, and we were all Harlequins, and a lot of us made millions. <laughs> <laughs> That's very apt. It was very lucrative. I guess it was, though, for at that for radio actors, wasn't it? Well, I, it was uh, extraordinarily lucrative, considering the fact that it uh, f- uh, came into full flower during the Depression. And it was a uh, period of stability for at least a fairly large group of actors, I would say, I would say wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, I would. I, I would think that uh, you could say that uh, over 600 actors in New York alone were making better than what would be known as a good living. And then you could do a play on... You could do a play on the side in the evenings, although that would cut in because in those days, remember, we had a great many evening shows and uh, they were among the highest paid. No, but I mean you could have uh, a soap opera running part five days a week and still still work on Broadway. It it was done. I managed to squeeze in a few plays. It was done, but it was difficult to do because everything was live. Remember that none of the network shows could be recorded. And for a long time, they had a ruling against any sort of, of Even recorded a effect. Right? Oh, Even the commercials. A commercial couldn't be recorded. Sometimes in a soap opera, there would be two of us. Say, Louis and I would be the entire cast of characters for that day, but the room would be full of people who were doing the commercial. There would be a harpist and a trio yeah. and an organist. A couple of actors, but yeah. there was a dramatized That's spot, right. and there you were. That's, you know, it's hard to believe when you know, work in radio today because. You know, this station is, like most of them, is on the air seven days a week and about 20 hours a day. And there are times when there are hours and hours that there's only one person here, an announcer. And the programming goes on, you know, talk programs, all recorded. All recorded. Eve, then we had something called a repeat. You had to repeat the show sometimes for the West Coast, and many of those took place at midnight. Didn't yeah. they? So the networks were really humming at, at midnight very often. A lot of uh, people... The Kate Smith show used to go from one to two, as I recall. That's right, yes. And that was because of the time difference with the Pacific Coast. And those had to be live. It wasn't until about the last four or five years of the big time in radio that those uh, rebroadcasts could be done from a recording taken off the air of the first one. And if something had gone on in the first one, you'd be called back to do it anyway. Yes, that's true. Your program, uh, When a Girl Marries was written by Elaine Carrington. Yes. I knew that without looking it up because she got such good billing, wasn't it? Didn't they used to say Elaine Carrington's When a Girl Marries? That's right. Yeah. That's right. She also wrote Pepper Young's Family. Was that the other? I knew there was yes. another one. And uh, Rosemary. Yeah. There were three. She was one of, I would say, a five or six at the most of the very top daytime serial writers. Yeah. Wouldn't you say, Louise, that she... I would say that she would... I'm right in, in there. I was, yes. I was almost going to say the top, but I, I don't want to offend perhaps, anybody. Yes. <laughs> Is she still around? Uh, no. She she passed on, oh, several years ago. Yeah. Yeah. The um, the great lady, I suppose, of daytime serials is Erna Phillips, who has yes. never been off the air since 1931. Yeah, and she's still on. She's still on. She has two uh, daytime serials, two. one on each network. Yeah. I didn't know there were such things left. Uh, you television. Must television. Television. Oh, television. Oh, oh. Well, she made the transition. She, she made the very transition fortunate. very easily. She had radio yeah. and TV going for a long time. Well, I think that probably the most prolific of all writers was Mrs. Hummert. Oh, Although yes, she actually no didn't do the dialogue writing, I don't believe. She laid out the plot lines, the storylines, for every soap opera that Black and Sample and Hummert had. And there, there were, they were legion. Oh, yes, they had... Uh, Ten or fifteen many, at one point. Oh, many more than, more than that. that. Oh, yes. Yes. Sure, they had the nighttime shows well, also. They had the finger right in the pie. I know that oh. uh, she used to attend every audition for an important character. I'd say three out of four of the radio uh, programs I do, uh, I revive, I should mm-hmm. say, like we're doing today, 
uh, our Hamrit shows. Yeah. I think even Mr. Keene and, and uh, things like that oh, yeah. were Oh, yes, Mr. Theatre and Mr. Keene and Mr. Chameleon. I'd like very much to interview Anne Hamrit. Does either of you see her anymore? Oh, yes. I yeah. saw her just about a week ago. Really? Because yes. uh, Arthur Hughes was on my program about a year ago, and I said, I know he's very friendly with her, and I said, you know, if you could possibly induce her to do the program, because she really should have some stories to tell. And he said, well, she was quite broken up, I guess, after Frank Hamrit died. And she really, he said, uh, you know, doesn't like to be reminded of the old days. But he said maybe again in a year or so. That's quite true. So I'd like to try it again. Quite now true. That the she is still by. very, very much uh, broken up. She was his secretary. Did you know that? In the beginning. Well, I yes, know, yes, was yes. yes. I'll tell you yeah. something further back than that. She was a classmate of my wife's in college. Oh, is that A fact that I don't think she ever knew, <laughs> which I didn't trade on. She was at one time a reporter on the Paris uh, Herald. And uh, Mr. Hummert was the top copywriter for Lasker, who was almost the father of modern advertising. Yeah, Albert Lasker, right? Yes, the, 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 the reason I bring this out is that the serials themselves seem so naive to us, didn't they, Louis? And yes, they did. still, they were, these were not naive people at all. It was uh, very carefully tailored to the market. Did they seem naive to you at the time when you were doing them? Were you kind of amused by them? Oh, the, the serials? Mm -hmm. Oh, all the serials seem naive to me. They still do. Well, they do now, I think, to me. But at the time, I, I you know, I found them quite... Well, brilliant. I don't think that you could go into a program like, say, Stella Dallas and really take it seriously mm -hmm. uh, as a piece of, uh, of great liter dramatic literature. It was... Uh, oh, you were playing in a, in, a, in a strip, as we know the comic strips today which carry storylines and have, are not at all funny, and yet you cannot take them seriously. And uh, these programs were designed to appeal to a, an intellectual level and an emotional level that was pretty earthy and pretty primitive, because that was the great, great audience, you say, that they were trying to reach. Uh, to uh, a sophisticated uh, daytime soap would never have even have died a morning. Well, they reached me, I must say, touched me and many times. Oh, they could. Oh, so there was very good writing. Let's make no mistake about it. There was a lot of hope, and there was very good acting in them. Too. I very don't good think acting, that yeah. there's any question that as far uh, that the best daytime serial that I ever heard was Helen Trent at the time uh, that a young woman named Martha Alexander was writing it, which was for a period of about two years, and it was it really yeah. stepped off almost into literature. She did she did wonderfully with it, and uh, that opinion was corroborated by. Uh, Thurber, when he did the uh, a series of articles he did on daytime radio, he listened for a long time and then wrote a series of articles which later became part of a book. And uh, he singled her out, too. I was fortunate in that I was playing the heavy during those years on Helen Trent. So we all did a lot of different you were things. You playing uh, Cynthia Swanson? Oh, yes. Well, didn't Vivian Smolin play Cynthia Swanson either later or before you? No, I don't think Vivian ever did. I was the original Cynthia Swanson, and when I left, when they took... Uh, when a girl marries uh, for a brief period uh, to California, I had to give up Helen Trent. And uh, Andrea Wallace took my place. I'm going to look this That's up right, now. That's right, isn't it, Louis? Isn't I don't recall. The little Irish girl. But while he's looking this up, I would like to point out one thing, that our judgment was tempered in those days because we were working on such a great variety of things, some of which were very beautifully written. Like, for instance, uh, Norman Corwin's program. Oh, yes. So that we, you couldn't come out of a, a Norman Corwin show and go and do a soap opera with uh, the vestments and the candles anymore. You know, you, the, the difference in level was, uh, was very not. marked. I was going to say that Vivian Smolin, uh, uh, not Vivian Smolin, but Mary Jane Higby, that I nearly met, oh, when this program first started about... Uh, Two, nearly two and a half years ago, because you're a Vivian Smolin's neighbor, aren't you? That's right. Yeah, yes. and I went up to uh, record a program, and she said, I can't promise, but I'll try to get Mary Jane Higby to come in, you know, and just say a few words. But you'd gone shopping or something. Uh, oh, that was nice. So uh, you didn't, but we got a very good Sorry. program program together anyway. Uh, I'm still looking at the, um, uh, the book I'm looking at uh, is the Golden Radio's Golden Age, which I always recommend when I do a program on radio because it's, it's very accurate. But speaking of books, why don't um, you all plug your books? Uh, Grossman Press sent me a copy of Mr. Van Ruten's book, but I didn't get it. So uh, tell me about it so I can go out and buy a copy. Well, uh, 
The book is rather strange because it was the result of a lot of doodling on the back of scripts during re rehearsals in the old radio days. It uh, was written over a period of, I should say, 15 years. What I did was to take Mother Goose rhymes and write them in French, but that is phonetic French, so that when you read them with a heavy French accent, you're really reciting Mother Goose in English. And then, much to my amazement, I discovered that these little poems in French had a meaning all their own, completely divorced from the original meaning. So I decided to put footnotes, translations, and uh, made, made it a very academic book, I played it with a straight face, and it's really so, quite funny sometimes. At least uh, people tell me it is. It's one of the, the wildest pieces of sophisticated camp I've ever seen in my life. And it has a far-reaching appeal. I must talk about this because I'm so excited about it. Um, I read it when I was visiting some friends in Milwaukee. I read it to a couple of children who were uh, aged 11 and 12, and I've never seen such reactions in my life because it, um, it sounds at first... It, you are reading French, and slowly it dawns on you that you're hearing an overtone of something else, and the little boy was just writhing with delight when he heard it. I do recall now seeing the uh, the review of it in the New York Times book section. It was a very York, good notice. The New York fact. Times did me very beautifully, and uh, uh, this week's Time magazine has a very nice review of it. Did you say the title of it? Modeur Goose Ram. Better spell that out, because they want to go out and get a copy. Well, it's M-O-T-S, D apostrophe H-E-U-R-E-S, G-O-U-S-S-E-S, R-A-M-E-S. Modeur Goose Ram. By Louis Van Ruten. By Louis Van Ruten. Published by Grossman. Mary Jane Higby, they can't go out and buy your book, but tell them about it, because I'm dying to see it. Well, I have just completed uh, what amounts to uh, a, a history of the years of radio from 1932 until the end of radio as we knew it, the great days of radio, uh, largely from an autobiographical standpoint. I wasn't really interested primarily in, in conveying the facts of my own life, only as they uh, touched on the radio field and as the radio field touched on my life. And uh, since it made up about, I would say, 14 hours a day there for many years, radio did, the two were pretty well intertwined. And uh, with the help of my various friends, like Mr. Van Ruten and uh, Mr. Stotts Cotsworth, who was uh, front page feral for so many years, and John Gibson and uh, other friends, they, um, I, I think that the book is quite accurate and very fact, very factual. It, it is... Uh, uh, as complete as I can make it, but it's com it's uh, from the light-hearted point of view. It's uh, not a social document by any means. It's really the the crazy and wild things that happened to us because it was a very. It was an insane period yes. in its way. It was. It was very curious. Uh, I, I went to the coast several times to make pictures, and while I was out there, I wouldn't do any radio at all. Partly as a vacation, really. And when I came back to New York after three or four or five weeks on the coast, I found that the first two or three days I was behind everybody. I hadn't uh, gotten back into that high pitch of uh, nervous excitement that was just part of the everyday life of a radio actor. You were always just about to give a performance. We would give as many as seven a day. Yeah. That was not impossible. No. And it wasn't, I, I would think that would be infrequent, but five wasn't infrequent. I gave ten one day. One day? Yeah. But that, that was a fluke, and it was very funny. There had been a blizzard, and oh, New yeah. York was snowed under. And I had a morning show. I fortunately lived near the subway that dropped me off right at NBC. And I went in and did my show, and as soon as I came out, about 9.30, I was grabbed by hands. And I just <laughs> went from one studio to another doing... All the parts in the world that I ever heard of played several leads, people that couldn't get in from the suburbs to do the show. I did ten that day. Yes, a, a sign, uh, the blizzard was the sign for the Manhattan actors to rush to the yes. station, even if they had no commitments for that day, because they knew the people couldn't get in from yes. Westchester and Connecticut. And uh, they tell me Chicago was even worse than a blizzard. And uh, Brett Morrison, who uh, was the shadow later and at that time was doing the first nighter. He I was know. the voice of the Brett first nighter. Brett Morrison, he's been on. Well, he uh, woke up one morning and saw the thick snow on the ground, so he quickly hired a sleigh. <laughs> and he was one of... And took all the actors in his neighborhood to the radio station. And they were 
four people turned up to do the full day. And in those days, Chicago was the home of the, uh, well, I think they had about 75% of the dramatic the broadcast at that time, yes. So he said that day they were just, they never rehearsed anything. They just read everything cold. And there was another wonderful story. Bernadine Flynn, who was Sade of Thick and Sade, came in that day. She still and, lives there, by the way. Oh, does she? Chicago. Mm-hmm. And she um, she did a show all by herself. She just took the script and read everyone's part and said, oh, no, oh, I didn't quite hear what you said. I can't hear you over the lawnmower. But, oh, you want me to go? <laughs> she did it that way. Did the whole 15-minute show. Is that in your book? It's a charming yes, story. Yes. You you know, you didn't tell the title of your book. You see, I'm an expert at The show at must books. go on. And on? That's the title <laughs> That's of the book. That's very cute. We have no publication date no, actually not yet. set yet. No. But, well, when you ha- when it comes out, you must come back and be Noah Drake, and we'll plug it some more. I would love to. All right, fine. Did your show have any giveaways that you remember? Now, when a Girl Mary has never had a giveaway. Is uh, but uh, I worked or? on many shows that did, and you did, oh, yes. too. We used to stop on Helen Trent and give away a lovebird pin. And it had a deathless phrase I shall never forget. Field and Farrington, the announcer, used to say, uh, a lovebird pin with real simulated gold flashing. Gold flashing. <laughs> real simulated <laughs> gold flashing. And we'd stop in the middle of a dramatic scene like sensible people. We'd be having a terrible fight. And I'd say, Helen, where did you get that lovely pin? She'd say, oh, this pin. And we'd talk about it for about three minutes. And then we'd go back to, I hate you. Don't you dare darken my door again. <laughs> they were always woven into the script. I thought of one, uh, a giveaway. Uh, recently, I went to see the, uh, a preview of Gone with the Wind, a trade screening. And I was sitting at the intermission talking to the fellow I was with who doesn't remember radio, he's too young. And I said, you know, there was a Scarlett O'Hara pin, and I think it was Campbell Soup sponsored some program because there was a Scarlett O'Hara cake uh, in which one poured a can of tomato soup. And that now doesn't that sound awful? But I remember... It really sounds yes, awful. Yes, because the, the lady next door to, one, to us uh, at that time, Mrs. Fetawa in Detroit, made one, and her husband came home, and she had cut a slice out of it. <laughs> and he said, what the hell is that, red cake? <laughs> and wouldn't eat it, but that was a Scarlet O'Hara cake. But if you bought to whatever it was, you got a Scarlet O'Hara pin, because in one of the scenes, I, I didn't think to look in the picture, she wears kind of a little cameo on one of her dresses, and that's what it was. It came in, oh, I don't know, now, this is does to or me. something like that. I haven't that. heard of that. I remember. Well, most of the giveaways were used very, very much by the children's programs. Yeah. I was in a... My first lead, actually, in radio was on a program in Cleveland for the Kroger Baking Company, local, called the Pirate Club. And the kids would cut off so many box tops and they would get a Pirate Chief hat and a Pirate Chief sweatshirt and a Pirate Chief this and a Pirate Chief that... And the program finally went bust because the kids were winning all the prizes and the company couldn't <laughs> afford them. I they learned know. later to make yeah. the simulated gold. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I don't remember that particular program, Mr. Van Ritten, but the Kroger stores, I think, are all throughout the Midwest. I guess they still are. Well, uh, they were at, at that time. They covered the state of Ohio, the Cincinnati. Uh, they were in Michigan, Cleveland. too. Were they at yeah. that time? I used to do recordings for the Kroger mm. company, I remember. Um, Did you both begin in Chicago? No, I no. started in Hollywood. I started in the old Bing Crosby show. The first thing I did was the old Shell show. With Shell Edward, Edward Everett Horton, yes. I started in Cleveland. On what? Was it the Pirate Show? The, well, it was that. We had uh, quite a few shows in Cleveland at the time. Yeah, Detroit did too. Yeah. People think it was just Hollywood and New York. But, no. Uh, Chicago, Detroit had quite a few shows right up to the end. Uh, you see the Green, Green Hornet. Hornet and uh, Lone Ranger the Lone that? Ranger were Lone both Ranger for, uh, and, Detroit uh, shows. The uh, Challenge of the Yukon, yeah. Ned Jordan, Secret Agent. Yeah. Cleveland didn't have as many um, um, network shows originating there, but they had a great many local shows. Cleveland had a show, uh, I think it came from Cleveland, but it was called um, something like The Battle of the Cities, and it would be between Cleveland and Detroit. Yeah. Do you remember? It was a yes. quiz show, and they would yeah. have contestants on from both. It was very much like the Julius Sanderson, uh, Frank uh, Hummert, Frank uh, Crummett show. 
Uh, by the way, I announced her as being dead about a year ago on this program, and she is not dead. Mm-hmm. She lives in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, at the local Sheraton Hotel there. And if anyone wants to write to her, she replies. But that's where she is. Oh. Was that the Battle of the Sexes? Battle of the Sexes, I was yes. on that one time, and I... Uh, As a contestant? Yes. I distinguished myself by saying that... Uh, that... Um, Oh, what was the thing now? It was a it was a gun, and I thought it was a salad dressing. Smith and Wesson. <laughs> People who never listened to me on anything else heard me on that. I got letters from all my friends. <laughs> he said, what's Smith and Wesson? I said, salad dressing. Yes, it was the men against the wo- women. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and we and had then... a group of radio people as a sort of publicity thing. I think we had the thin man and the... Uh... It seems to me during every program, someone would say, Oh, Miss Sanderson, won't you sing something for us? And uh, more often than not, it was, uh, they wouldn't believe me. <laughs> Which I guess was her big hit in The Gale from Utah. 1911, just think. She was a star in 1911. Yes, it's fabulous. It really is. What other roles did you, you play? I think you told a few of Miss Higby, Van Rudin. Well, I think that the uh, one part that I played the longest was um, Bulldog Grumman's man, Gentleman's Gentleman, Denny. And I played that something like nine years. Is Are any of the Bulldog Grumman's around? Because I'd love to do uh, a program on that. Let's see. George Coloris is in England. Ned Weaver is on the coast. And uh, I forget who was. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Santa Ortega is in town. Oh, that's right. Yes. He was Bulldog Yes, he was Grumman. Bulldog Grumman. We must Grumman get together again and, and do a Bulldog and, Grumman. Um, uh, there uh, was a period, I think, where there was a replacement. I forget it, whether it was um, uh, Ortega or um, Ned Weaver, but we had about four. Uh-huh. So I had only did the show once. I love that show. I remember the opening with the, the foghorns. Yes, and the, the announcer foghorn would say, out of the fog, fog, out of the night. Yes. That was Bulldog Grumman. Is that right? Indeed, yes. Yeah, they played that, that horn that always made me think of B.O., the uh, Life Boy yeah. ad. Uh-huh. Well, George Coloris was, I think, the most fun to work with in that bunch, and I want to tell you a little story about him, because the last minute of the show was a scene between Bulldog Drummond and myself, in which he would explain to me how he had solved the crime. And George was a terrible clown, and on the air one day, I was waiting for a cue from the control room to start the scene after the music bridge, when all of a sudden, from the other side of the microphone, comes Coloris's voice saying, Well, Denny, suppose you explain to me this week how I solved the crime. And left me with my tongue hanging out, my mouth open, and I had to rewrite the whole final scene. There was nobody left in the control room that I could see. They were all on the floor. Did they take those things lightly? I mean, because I don't think in television they let you play a lot oh, around like no, that. No, they wouldn't today, dare. Would they? they wouldn't dare. But you see, the thing that happened... In radio, particularly when you were on a show week after week after week, you became so accustomed to working with the people that uh, if an, uh, an untoward accident happened, you, you could cover very quickly because you knew that everybody would react and how they would react. And uh, in some shows, when you got a madman like George Coloris, who was a beautiful, marvelous actor, but with a pixie sense of humor, anything could happen, and very often did. <laughs> I have seen, I think perhaps the commercial was the most serious oh, thing. Yes. And still, I have seen an actor, on several occasions, I've seen different actors walk up to the announcer and light the script. Yes. Take a cigarette lighter and light the announcer's script while the announcer was in mid-commercial. <laughs> and he'd be holding one corner and then the other, hoping he could get through it. <laughs> I think we've got about seven minutes left, so I think we should talk a little bit about when a girl marries. Because in case someone tuned in and they didn't, know what we were doing the program about, or they'd never heard When a Girl Marries. Tell a little bit about the plot, will you? Oh, well, the story of When a Girl Marries was um, a wealthy girl who married a young man who had been brought up by a widowed mother and not had the advantages that her family had, and the lines were very uh, definitely drawn between their friends, and she made the selection of going and living in a small uh, house and the other side of town, over the track, so to speak, and there was uh, always the conflict uh, there between the two families, and it was a it was a very it was set up very very well in the beginning because it was possible of enormous ramifications. His uh, brother, he was an attorney, but his brother uh, ran a garage, and uh, there there was the difficulty with that family uh, that could be brought in. So we had many plots going 
At the same time, Louie, you were on that program many times. I remember you as a criminal one time. Well, I... And uh, I uh, I remember one time, I think perhaps you were on the uh, the time when I really made history as one of the of the most drawn-out sequences that ever took place in radio. Uh, it's become quite historic now. Uh, the leading lady who was caught for seven days in a revolving door. I started through a door, and seven days later I came out. But, of course, you know, it was the long, drawn-out time. I had heard that, but I didn't know what program it was. Yes, that was When a Girl Marries. And, uh, of course, it wasn't. Uh, they didn't detail every moment of doing that door. It was because there were so many other plots going. And they'd take you off to another section of town, and they'd come back, and I'd still be in the revolving door. And, Louis, you had... A similar thing on Pretty Kitty Kelly, didn't you, when you got into an elevator? We got into an elevator on Monday and didn't get off until the following Monday, going up three floors. Probably the slowest descent in history. They used to fry an egg for two or three days at oh, the yeah. Mark yeah. Kirk. And yeah. I didn't know you were on Pretty Kitty Kelly. I'd, if I had known that, I'd have worn a pin I have, and it says, Columbia Broadcasting System, listen to Pretty Kitty Kelly, and it's in a lovely shade of green. It has her picture, Eileen Blackburn. Was oh, Eileen yes. Blackburn, yeah. Right in, the, right in the center. But Collier was on that, too. Yeah, he was the... Uh, Matt Crowley. And um, Dick I, Colmar. Oh, yes, Dick was the on. Reason, he played... uh, the reason that I played John's other wife was that Dick was on uh, both shows, and uh, he had to get from uh, Columbia to NBC in an ambulance, which he had hired which would take him across because the programs were practically back-to-back. And then I had, to, I guess the Humberts uh, were a little nervous about this, and they said, we, well, this can't go on, we'll have to get another John. So I was it. He was playing Jack Orpington, millionaire playboy, yeah. on uh, Pretty Kitty Kelly yeah. at the time. And I was, the f- I played three heavies on that show. In fact, uh, Pretty Kitty Kelly was my first soap opera in New York. Oh, really? And I went on playing Mr. Astrakhan. Oh, that's right, Mr. Astrakhan. I remember because I did commercials on it yeah. quite often. If you talk to any of the radio people who were working in radio in depth, you'll find out that all of us did, I would say, many thousands of programs. Oh. You see, we were on nearly everything. I suppose Louis Van Wooten was on every soap opera in, that came out of New York. I was on every one except one, Easy Aces. I never got on that. Oh, I was never on Easy Aces. My husband was. It was a very, very closed, a very small cast. And yes, didn't I was going to say, they didn't, show. Uh, really. But uh, I was on practically every other daytime show, and I don't think that I missed any of the nighttime shows. I did them at least once. I think we have just enough time, about two minutes, uh, while our engineer is queuing up the, the love theme again from whatever, from... Uh, when a girl marries, to plug your books. Mary Jane Higby's uh, won't be out for a while, but the name of it is uh, The Show Must Go On and On. Is that right? By Mary Jane Higby. We can look forward to that. Louis Van Ruten, you do yours. I can't pronounce for Oh, now, come on. It's <laughs> Mother Goose Ram. Mother Goose Rhymes. And I haven't read it, so I can't recommend it, but the New York Times did, and Mary Jane Higby did. I recommend it very highly. There was I was just dying to say, Kiri, de Kiri, Doc. <laughs> The Meuse ran oop the clock. <laughs> well, I'd like to say uh, thanks to you both, uh, Mary Jane Higby, who uh, played the uh, main role in When a Girl Marries for so many years, and Mr. Louis Van Ruten, very well-known veteran radio actor. So until um, next week at the same time, this is Richard Lamparski. Thank you for listening. Good night.